everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Between the Ears Show. I'm Skylar Callan. Joined with me today is Zach Campbell, a contributor here on Mountaineers Now, a site presented by Sports Illustrated and Fan Nation. And since we're at the halfway point, West Virginia's three and three on the year, one and two in Big Twelve Conference play. What better time than to start whipping out some grades here? And we're going to do that with our report cards. We're going to go with one player on each side of the ball. We're going to break down the entire side of the or the entire offense, the entire defense as well. And then we're going to round things out talking about Neil Brown and what he's done so far and kind of the trajectory that he is on with this program. So to get things started, Zach, we're going to go to the offensive side of the ball. We're going to talk about the quarterback, JT Daniels. Tremendous season so far. Um, I think – for me, he's lived up to the billing. He's lived up to the hype. Um, and really, if you look at the numbers, I mean, they're not staggering, but they don't need him to be Will Greer, right? They don't need him to be 2017, 2018 Will Greer kind of numbers because of the running game that they have. Three really good running backs. They have a very well-balanced offense. I want to hear your thoughts on this first before I whip out my grade. Yeah, so – I think JT's, and it depends on, I guess, person to person, what your expectations were before the season. But, you know, I'm I'm pegging him as a B-plus so far, halfway through the season. Only reason I say he's just shy of that, that A territory is because he hasn't had, hasn't had those video game type numbers. We haven't seen him just completely take over a game and just go gangbusters on a defense. But he's been so consistent, so solid. I mean, you know, he's nine to three touchdown interception rate. Two of those interceptions aren't on him, right? right? He's played really clean football. He's been amazing in the pocket. He's not tried to overextend himself. You know, he's not tried to play hero ball. I feel like he's, you know, he's kind of worked off what the defense has given him. But, man, he's made some NFL throws in, in every game. I mean, he's, there's been a couple of throws where I'm just like, you can't be more on the money than that. Back foot cross field, you know, just stuff like that, where it's like, that's five stars. That's, that's why he's five stars. Um, so I'm real big on JT halfway through the season. I think if, if the pocket can stay clean, they can, he stays upright, stays uninjured. I mean, he's going to finish the season doing more than enough for West Virginia to win. Yeah. I'm, you're going B plus. I'm going to go slightly higher. I'm going to go a minus. And the only reason I'm going a little higher is because I think of what this offense would be if he weren't here. And, I mean, I don't know what that would look like. If it would be Garrett Green, I would assume. Maybe Goose Crowder. I highly doubt it would be Nico Markell as a true freshman. But you you factor that in plus what they had a year ago with Jared Dagey. <laughs> like, it's, it's night and day. This is by far the best quarterback play that we've seen in the Neil Brown era. And I think just having a quarterback that takes care of the football, that can make those NFL-type throws, he's going to give you a chance to win every single game. I don't know about you, but I feel like every time JT Daniels has the ball, there's a chance that they're going to go put it in the end zone. Like, I don't think that that feeling existed so much over the last couple of years. It's, it's definitely novel. It's it's a return to that, you know, last time I felt any anything like that was 2018 – and Will Greer was lined up uh, in, in shotgun. And I, uh, and, and I agree. And I, and I could have, I thought very hard about, you know, giving him the nod for, for an A grade. But like I said, I think what the only thing he's lacking, and I know this is kind of secondary tertiary to the job of a quarterback. It doesn't matter that he's not throwing, you know, 450 yards game, but you'd almost want to see that because it, because yeah. You know, sees kind of his eyes turn red a little bit and be like, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm going to take over. I'm going to show you all why, you know, why I'm here and why I'm, why I'm running the show. So, I mean, but he's, he's played phenomenal. I mean, he's, he's done, he's done everything that we could have asked him to. And uh, I'm never worried when he's out there. Yeah. There's I, no I, sense of concern. Or, I think he and Graham Harrell have done a, a very good job with this offense so far. Now let's, let's slip over to the defensive side real quick and talk about the leader of that unit Dante Stills uh, 15 tackles four tackles for loss two and a half sacks the sack production hasn't quite been there um, over the last couple of years I think it's kind of been a little bit 
down from what we would expect out of Dante, but I don't think he's a guy that you can just look at and, and look at the sacks and say, okay, well, he's not playing as well because you it's so much more than that. You If you really dig into the film and watch all the plays that he's creating for others to make, I mean, it, he, he is probably playing his best football right now, and I just don't think the numbers are going to indicate that. And – that that's that's why I give, I'm going with an A minus for for Dante at this point in the season because to your point he's not a guy whose numbers are gonna are gonna pop and are gonna just you know shoot through the screen um, he's not that kind of player but if you but if you've followed the the season closely if you've watched and if you you know specifically watched him. Um, Every play, he's either getting double teamed, he's getting held, you know, yeah. getting, you know, put in a chokehold. I mean, those aren't stats that you're going to keep track of. That's not, those aren't things that are collated that people, but I'm looking at him right now and I'm like, he's such a monster. He's, he's, a, he's accounting every play they have to account for. His presence is felt on every play and he's never looked this big. He's never looked this fast. Um, and he's made game turning plays. He's made several of them last week. And, and, and yeah. And, you know, I, I think, I think he's a guy, like if you were to, if you were to take him out of the game completely, let's say he misses a game for whatever reason, that defense is going to look a whole lot different without him in it because he demands so much attention, every play, whether it's pass rush, whether, whether it's just run contain, whatever it is, um, yeah, he's transformative in that sense. And, and I, you know, watching him, it's like if if they actually called half the holding penalties on him, uh, I dare say West Virginia would have at least one more win in the win column, just just based off penalty yardage alone. Um, so, yeah, so I've been I've been super, super impressed with Dante. He clearly came back with a mission and I don't think there's any more he could be doing individually. Um to, to help this team win. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you with an A minus, and I think he can get to an A plus. I think he can certainly play his way up to that um, if the sacks do start coming. And at that point, that's how you know he's playing at extremely high level because all the double teams, all the chips, all the the slides and protection that they're sending his way. If he's still getting to the quarterback at that point, then I mean it, it, he's an unblo- unblockable force. So. I'm going to go A minus with Dante still, too. So now let's go to the, the overall side um, of the defense. We'll go with the defense first here. I got to say, it's been a little disappointing, <laughs> and I think that's that's putting it nicely. You know, Jordan Leslie's done a fine job as the defensive coordinator here over the last couple of years, has actually been one of the best defenses in the Big 12 since he's taken that unit over. A lot of attrition, a lot of new faces, and it's looked like it on the field. What do you got for the defense? I think I'm – some folks out there might say I'm being too generous. So I went C- minus uh, overall in the defense. Here's the deal. Like last week, good Baylor team not, – not a great Baylor team, but a good Baylor team defending Big 12 champs. Um, yes, you gave up however many hundreds of yards to them. I think it was – you know, if it wasn't in the 500s, it was – yeah. I mean, it gave up a lot of yardage and, and obviously enough points that they could have won that game. But they also made some huge plays, some team defense type plays. Sean Martin rushes, gets the, gets the strip. Sear Cox comes up, scoops and scores. If you can make plays like that, it doesn't matter how many yards you're giving up at the end of the day if you get a win. And look, they're they're stacked even in wins and losses. They're at three and three, right? Yeah. So. I feel like up front, defensive line especially has been great. I think just across the board. I think even the linebackers, like, you know, Lee Koba has really shown out this year. And I feel like I see him all over the screen at, at, at every, you know, at every instance. It's that secondary that really, really needs some love because we're getting, we're getting now into the, the real thick of the Big 12. And we've seen what happens when, when you guys, I mean, obviously Charles Woods being out. Fingers crossed he's back healthy this week. This secondary is not not really built for 
for going up against some of these offenses that just air it out like Texas Tech does. You know, they're number two in the nation right now, pass yardage per game. Um, if the secondary was a little bit better at even two positions or a little bit deeper at two positions, I think we'd be having a different conversation. But they just give up too many yards. They're too thin on the back end. And there's just not enough talent to fill those gaps. I mean, the, guy, the guys you see out there are, are the guys that, you know, Jordan Leslie has. So I don't know if there's a fix for that. I think we're just this is this is what we're gonna look like the rest of the year, walking out there. Um, so I've seen some good things from the defense. I've seen some pretty pretty miserable things from the defense. I think you know when you come out in the wash, they're they're leaving a lot to be desired, but they have a tendency to make some big plays. And it, as long as you can do that, you can overcome giving up huge stretches of yardage. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Man, I'm I'm so back and forth. I'm gonna go D plus. I'll be a little bit more pessimistic here, um, but I do understand. You know what exactly what you said. That's why I was almost right there with you with the D, uh, C minus because although they gave up a ton of big plays, when they needed to come up with a big play the most, they did. Whether it be Aubrey Burks punching the ball out, just your cops scooping one up, Aubrey Burks coming down with an interception, Dante Stills. I, even though it's special teams, I still kind of consider it defense, you know, getting the blocked field goal and returning it for a touchdown or for two points. So, like, those things ha- hold a lot of weight. But at the end of the day, man, like, the, the Big 12 this year, it feels like it's kind of reverted back to what it was known as, that high explosive, you know, old-fashioned shootouts. That's kind of what it's gone back to, at least for this year. There's a lot of big offenses that are still left on the schedule, and I don't know how that secondary is going to hold up against them. When it comes to the running game, I thought they've done an okay job. They're they're only allowing like 112 yards a game, which isn't great. It's not terrible, um, but I think if they can just find some answers, they don't have to find all the answers. But if they can just find some answers with that back end, yeah, I think this could be an average defense. And with that offense that you have, that's really all you need to be a seven or eight win team. Now, so I'm going to go with a D plus. No. Let's go to the offense real quick. I don't know if you can grade any higher than an A plus, but I think that's where I'm going to go here with A plus. And and I know and I know it's it's tough because A plus is almost like perfect, right? Like you, right on the money. But when it is perfect, when you lose your your leading rusher and you still run for as many yards as they did against the Baylor Bears, and, and that Baylor defense has been lights out against the run all year. That, that showed me a lot about Graham Harrell because I, going into that game, I said that one of the keys of the game was Graham Harrell cannot go back to his, his whole air raid system and abandon the run game. And he didn't. He stuck to it, even with without his leading rusher. So to have an offense that runs for 180, 190 yards a game, throws for 260, 270, you're putting up nearly 40 points a game, I don't know how you can get much better. I know there's some, there's some little areas that we can kind of tweak um, and, and, and critique a little bit, but I, I think Graham Harrell and, and JT Daniels in this offense is just clicking on all cylinders right now. I, I got to give him an A plus. I'm going to come in just, just below you, A, solid A, but I agree in almost every sense. I mean, looking here, you know, West Virginia's offense ranks number 20 nationally in team offense. I mean, you know, pass yards per game, rush yards per game. This is a balanced offense. This is not, to your point, this is not that Dalston Red Bull, you know, uh, going going crazy on a Friday night. Like, you know, this is this is utilizing run and pass to complement each other. Um, and I and I and I love seeing that because we already knew to some extent that JT was going to come in and be a huge improvement from where we were the last, last few years. No one expected CJ Donaldson. No one knew who he was. Yeah. Right. And barring his, his injury, obviously, which he's now, it sounds like he's got a green light to come back from and play this weekend. Um, he and Tony Mathis and Justin Johnson have been just an absolute breath of fresh air to come in and a three, you know, three headed monster at the running back position. And on the heels of having to replace a guy like Letty Brown, 
I mean, this offense has done everything anyone could have could have could have asked. I mean, wideouts have played well, but for a couple drops here and there, still a little bit of an issue, a little bit of an issue, and that's kind of where I didn't grade any hires because some of those some of those issues with drops, like they got they they have to stop. Yeah, um, those are drive killers, and the O line for all intents and purposes, I think has played better and better each week. So, yeah, I, I did, this offense is going to give West Virginia a chance to win every game they're in, regardless of who they're playing, where they're playing. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun watching it. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just hoping that that can con- continue. People can stay healthy, and they don't change what they're doing because what they're doing is a working formula. And so, credit to Graham Harrell. And credit to the powers that be for bringing him in and giving him the the keys to the car. Yeah, and you know what? I know we're not going to grade this, but I, I got to get I got to give my credit to Matt Moore, the offensive line coach, because he's taken a lot of heat over the last couple of years, and even really yeah, early he has. too. And that unit has just been phenomenal. Like the offensive line has just done amazing things, opening up wide gaps for the running game, protecting JT. So I mean, hats off to him. Now let's then you go. Gotta- Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, sorry, just one last thing. Taking into, taking into consideration who West Virginia's played and some of the defenses they've seen, you know, they open up with Pitt, even Virginia Tech, um, Texas. I mean, Baylor's defensive front is absolutely massive, and they've been able to move guys like that out of the way, create run lanes, create good pockets for JT Daniels. Yeah, huge, huge helmet sticker to them. Now let's go to the main guy, the head coach, Neil Brown. And this is this is going to be a fun one because I, I really want to see where you're, you're gauging Neil Brown at right now. And I know what the fans want to grade him as. And that's still coming off of a win against the defending Big 12 champs. This is hard for me because it's so inconsistent. Like, the first two games of the year, you – I mean, it, it's hard to say, but, like, you, it would be hard to get anything above a D – to Neil, you come back, you look at the last four games, and it's like, okay, yeah, they've won three of four, but two of those three wins are against Towson and two and five Virginia Tech. So how much weight do you really put into this little run that they're on right now? I, I don't know, but I'll say this. The way they played in Texas – and having to wait that long uh, after the bye week to get that bad taste out of their mouth, and when they found, when they fell behind seventeen to seven against Baylor, that was a very scary moment of the game because if they let that game get out of hand, I think yeah, this that one that could have really affected his grade and really his job security. But they bounced back, fought through the adversity, came back and actually won that game. So I'm gonna give them. I'm gonna be. Right there with what what he's done so far. C, flat C. He's been inconsistent. He's been good, been bad. I'm gonna give him a C, and he can he can determine how he finishes out this season. So I'm gonna go with the C. Uh, hate to hate to be boring and just you know mirror you, but I was, but you said it because we've seen both both extremes play out. We've seen some pretty miserly awful stuff whether it was clock management play calling for go for it well don't go for fourth and one at pit do no one's ever going to forget that that kind of thing um but then we've seen to your point i I think that the best instance of mental toughness and you know strapping them up and and basically saying you're like there's there's no way we're losing this game is 17-7 Baylor. It's like here we go again, you know, because they got down 28 nothing against Texas, and that wasn't a hole they were digging out of. But they came back and beat Baylor, mashed them blow for blow. I think there was some amazing play calling down the stretch, and they're doing this, you know, C.J. Donaldson not playing, Charles Woods not playing, a couple of their best players at at any position aren't even on the field, right? Um, so that's so that you know when you when you weigh both extremes against one one or the other, you end up somewhere right exactly in the middle, and that's where it is. And I know that the fan base, and there's a lot of reactionaries out there, have called for his job. I mean, been sharpening their pitchforks, all that stuff. 
Um, I think you need to be a little more measured because it's like, okay, you're sitting at 500. It's, it's a C that's just, that's what it is. And there's still a lot of football left. So the big 12 is wide open too. What? Yeah. The conference is wide. There's, there's no, there's no Ohio state. There's no, uh, I was going to say Alabama, Tennessee, congratulations to them. There's no, (laughs) there's no Tennessee in this conference. So, I mean, there's weeks and weeks yet of football. Who knows? Maybe, maybe this team, maybe it was that moment against Baylor, that 17, seven, where this something ethereal clicked. And what we're going to see play out is a much different football team. I don't know, but I think, I think you and I both want to see Neil succeed. We have no reason for him not to succeed. Will he, won't, won't he? No clue, but it's a C grade. Been some really good. There's been some really bad. We'll see which, which side of the scales tip. Yeah, and I think if you look at the pick game, they're a fluke interception away from winning that game. They're <laughs> maybe uh, a bad decision by JT Daniels. Or actually, I, I shouldn't even say that for JT because it goes back to Taj Olsen's late hit. That If you knock that out of the game, I mean, they probably win that one too. So it's just a couple plays here and there that has really kind of separated this team from being three and three or five and one. So we'll see how they finish out. They're sitting at three and three at the midway point. They need three more ones to get the bowl eligibility. And oddly enough, just like the how the season has been so far up and down, they still have to play the top three teams in the conference as well as the bottom three teams. So if we go chalk here, they'll be sitting at six and six whenever we recap this thing at the end of the year. Well, one, one thing I will say, this game this weekend, Neil Brown in his tenure at West Virginia is 0 against Texas Tech. They've had – just had have had his number if they can go to Lubbock against a team that is just painting the sky <laughs> with 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 their version of what looks like an air raid. Um, if they can go down there and get a win, I'm feeling far differently about this team oh, after yeah. this weekend than, than I than I would have a week or two ago. So That's- I think this is this is his biggest game yet by far in in terms of shaking the monkey off his back, getting a win on the road against Texas Tech. I think you almost kind of feel like you're starting fresh uh, with, at zero with a, with a clean slate. Yeah, and winning on the road has not been has not come easy for Neil Brown. He's 6-13 and 13 on the road. No. He's been at West Virginia 5-10 and 10 in the Big 12 on the road. So that would really show that things are maybe heading in the right direction. And the next week, I mean, you got top 10 TCU coming to town. That's a chance for a signature win. If you win that one, man, it's – the, the the floodgates are open to start going on a run. So or you or you lose both and then yeah. uh, <laughs> think, think. and we're back to where we were two weeks ago. So. <laughs> but again, yeah, it's a, it's a giant question mark. There's 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 no way to quantify how this is going to play out. Um, it's like we'll all be watching. And there you have it. So there's our our mid season report cards. Again, this has been the Between the Ears Show. I'm Skylar Callahan. Join with me today with Zach Campbell. Be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube at Mountaineers Now. You can follow us on Twitter at Mountaineers Now as well. Don't forget, on Thursday, the walkthrough game day show with myself and Eugene Napoleon. We're going to preview West Virginia, Texas Tech, and give our predictions as well. Saturday night, we'll have the Mountaineers Now post game show with Eugene and myself. So until then, take care. <laughs>